Hi there, welcome to my topic, Big Data on the Farm, Creating Value for the Farmer. Thanks for joining me. My name is Kevin McNew, and I am Chief Economist with Farmers Business Network. I'd like to thank the North Carolina Soybean Association for letting me have a few minutes to chat with you about this topic. And I'm excited to talk about it because I think it's one of these topics that a lot of people don't really know what big data is, and especially in agriculture, uh, we want to know, you know, what's the punchline? Where does it help me as a farmer in being a better farmer, either growing a better crop or making a better return on the investment that I'm doing? So to motivate this talk, I'm going to, uh, first of all, talk to you about Farmers Business Network and what it is that we do. And specifically, you know, how do we use big data to help the farmers in our network? And I'm going to break this out into kind of three major themes in the next 25 minutes. Uh, the first of those themes is going to be what I call information value. It's sort of like you can think about what am I learning from my neighbor or my neighbor's neighbor or my neighbor's neighbor's neighbor. It's the collective information we get from being a part of this network and helping us make better decisions. And then from there, I want to talk about how FBN's market data, uh, big data and, and, and market analytics helps promote market transparency. In other words, being able to understand the world and the markets in which we operate better and to make better informed decisions. And then finally, I want to, I want to close with talking about how big data can help farmers better respond to consumer trends. And this is especially important as consumer trends are shifting around things that are not necessarily measurable in terms of the commodities that we produce. So those are the three topics I'm going to start with. Uh, before I dive into that, let me talk about what is Farmers Business Network or FBN. First of all, FBN was started about six years ago by a small group of farmers in the Midwest who said, you know, each of us have a lot of data flowing off of our combines, off our planters. You know, wouldn't it be great if we all got together and shared that data and made better decisions as a result of what we were learning from everyone who's in the network. And so that was the genesis or the premise of how FBN was started. It was a, a network of farmers that were devoted to sharing information, providing unbiased analytics, and advancing transparency in the farm economy. Now, today, that collective small network of farmers that started in the Midwest now encompasses uh, two countries, the US and Canada, where we have a total of over 12,000 farmers contributing data, providing analytics or, or getting back analytics uh, around their operation and in total over 40 million acres. And FBN has also evolved over the last six years to service the needs of our clients across four main pillars. One is the analytics, which I'm gonna talk broadly about uh, in this talk, but also we have what we call our FBN direct side, which is really our, our, our direct to farmer uh, platform for selling chemicals, seed, fertilizer, and, and the likes. And then also crop marketing and finance as well uh, are, are units of our FBN business. So why a farmer network? Why should farmers come together to form a network? We can think about kind of traditional models of farm networks. Those are things like we think of in terms of cooperatives. You know, cooperatives were farmed as a collection of farmers or a network of farmers. And the premise of it was <clears throat> to, to enhance transactional value. You know, by being one in the transaction as opposed to individuals that were smaller, we could, be, you know, hopefully influence the buying or selling prices that we were doing business at. And so that was really the, you know, that's been around for a long time. We've seen co-ops evolve. Uh, and exist for quite some time around the transactional benefits of being in a farm network. But I'm going to talk more about the informational value. And that's what's important for uh, what, what this talk is about and, and how we operate at FBN is it's the user generated knowledge. Again, you have the information, you have, you know, 20, 30 years of experience farming, your neighbor might have different farming experiences and, and lots of years of experience. And so we're bringing all that collective user generated knowledge together to help inform decision making. So the informational value is we're building bigger and better data. It's objective data. It's not commercially motivated. And that's what I think is key to why uh, FBN exists is we're trying to help farmers make better decisions that are not commercially motivated. 
If you want to understand how a seed is going to perform in your land, chances are, historically at least, you had to get that information from the company that was selling you that seed. And that just seems kind of fundamentally wrong to how information and objectivity should work. So our goal is to provide this data uh, and improve decision making. So, you know, at the core of this, we are trying to make uh, the world your plot trial. So again, you have your own individual farm information, but you're able to tap in and gain insights from farmers who have uh, different fertilizer application rates, different planting rates, all the different mechanisms, the levers that you can choose in making a farm decision around growing a crop. That's information that gets stored and utilized in our analytic models uh, for FBN farmers. So the analytics revolution that, that we're seeing at FBN as well as other companies are doing, it's basically trying to develop bigger data sets uh, and use them in a fashion to help us focus on prediction. You know, which crop would be better served in the soil types and the uh, meteorological weather setup that you have. It's not necessarily focused on what is kind of an academic setting of hypothesis testing. You know, we're really focused on prediction and making a concrete decision. So in our framework at FBN, you know, we focus a lot on yields and productivity. <clears throat> And so, you know, within season, farmers who are, are participating in our data center are getting yield predictions about each individual plot of land that they have. You know, they planted a certain variety of seed, they planted it on a certain day, they're applying fungicides, they're applying uh, herbicides, whatever the case may be. And that input is going into the system that helps in turn predict what their yield is gonna be uh, at the end of the growing season. And so the other thing we can do is obviously say, all right, uh, if I choose a certain variety of seed, what are the kind of, you know, levers I can pull? I can change the seeding rate. Uh, I can change the, you know, the planting date. And so because we have all this wealth of data from individual farmers on any given variety of seed, we can begin to ask very specific questions like how does seeding rate impact the yield potential? And so this is a chart that is just showing that there is, uh, at low levels of seeding rate, there's a better response if you keep adding more seed uh, per acre, but eventually it flattens out. And so eventually you reach kind of this plateau. And so that's data that is individualized to specific seed varieties that, that wouldn't be available to most farmers. You know, they wouldn't have the benefit of this collective wisdom from all the farmers in the network. And then finally, you know, another cool thing that we're able to do with that data is, you know, imagine you're a farmer and, you know, in your lifetime, you may have planted, you know, 10, 20, 20 different varieties of seed. Uh, and, and you want to know, you know, what's the best variety of seed to use to enhance your yield? Well, if you're a, an individual farmer, then by just simply picking the varieties you've chosen or you've selected in your lifetime, you're going to increase your yield by about six bushels an acre. But when you look at all the different farmers in the network, you're gonna increase your yield by up to 16 to 17 bushels an acre. So there's a big benefit by being able to expand beyond just what your knowledge is and expand and learn from the collective action of the farmers. So that in essence is kind of the benefits of why information is valuable and how it's shared within a network type of environment. Here's a quote from one of our farmers who says, I use FBN a lot to help with my seed selection. The tools that FBN has developed uh, really help him hone in on particular field seed selection practices. And so that's just one uh, example of that. Let me change gears now and talk about transparency. What is price transparency or transparency in general? It's one of those things that you know you're in a transparent market. If you see it, and you know you're in one when you, or you know you're not in one when you when you see it as well. So, what are some of the characteristics we can say to make a market transparent? I think probably one of the most most uh, telling things about a, a transparent market is it's easy to obtain prices. And in the days of the internet, that is certainly true in many many uh, consumer related products and and in general, you know, you want to know, uh, you know. Uh, French doors that you want to install on your house, you can do, go Google search it and look for 
doors at uh, Lowe's and doors at Home Depot and doors at any other place and start to comparison shop. So you can easily obtain prices. You can compare prices of different choices, you know, door A versus door B. Again, I'm able to easily compare those on the internet. Uh, you probably also have some understanding of how prices are set. You know, there's some cost of production going into it. Uh, maybe there's uh, transportation costs. And then finally, you know, if there is some discrimination going on in pricing, you know, you get a different price than someone else, you're, you're aware of that. You understand the rules of the game. And a good example of that is like movie tickets. You know, you go to a movie, there's different prices if it's a child or someone who's under 14 or a senior citizen. We understand that uh, is kind of how the price discrimination works. Now, a non-transparent market, you basically can flip all of these on its side. You can't obtain prices easily. You can't compare different choices. It's very hard to understand how prices are set. And you're not really even aware that price discrimination is going on. And I wanna contend that there's probably one area of agriculture in particular where I think we've seen the implications of price transparency not existing, and that is in the seed industry. When we look at cost of production changes at the farm level over the last 20 years, where do we see the biggest cost of production increases? It really is in the cost of seed. So seed costs in the US for corn have increased 280% over the last 20 years. Compare that to fuel costs, which are up about 30%, fertilizer costs up about 60 to 70%, chemicals barely even moving, and the overall yield that, uh, for corn yield is only up about 36%. So you have this huge divide between how much seed costs have increased versus how much yield's gone up. Yield's only gone up 36%. And of course, we all know that prices of corn uh, and other agricultural goods have not really improved that much as well. So clearly there's kind of this squeeze that's going on. Seed costs are getting higher. Uh, profitability is not moving in a similar direction. And I would contend that seed industry practices such as seed relabeling and zone pricing are probably, um, you know, things that, that promote a industry that is not very transparent. So how does seed transparency or how does the lack of seed transparency work? Um, we did a very, very detailed study and we, we in fact continue to, to revisit this research every year. And it starts with farmers contributing seed tags. So they, they buy all this seed during the growing season and, and plant it. We're getting the actual seed tags from every bag of seed that farmers contribute. We're also getting invoices around what they're paying. And we put together every year for the last, I believe it's four years now, a seed relabeling report. So I'd encourage you to go take a look at that if you're interested. But the idea is this, that the genetics of the seed are labeled according to a variety of them. But that doesn't necessarily always coincide with the brand or even the name of the seed that's on the bag. So you can buy, you know, brand X's seed and brand Y seed, and they'll have different names, different commercial names in the marketplace but they can actually be the exact same genetics. And that's controlled by the variety number on the seed tag. So that's very unclear as to what that is, that, that uh, six to eight digit variety number is unique and tells you that it's a unique type of seed or a unique genetic. But the labeling of it from the brand name, from the commercial name that the brand uses, all of that can be different from, from one variety to the next. So that makes it exceptionally challenging. What we found when we embarked on this seed relabeling study is that about half of the corn and soy seeds are sold under multiple brands. And the other thing we found is that a lot of companies, about two thirds of the seed companies engage in some sort of relabeling. And so that makes it very hard to know. Uh, the other thing we found is that when we matched seed tags to seed pricing, we found there was a lot of overpaying for seed. You know, that's not terribly surprising. If it's hard to disentangle what the product actually is, chances are the company that's selling it to you might be able to get away with higher prices. And we found empirical evidence data that suggests that there is some overpaying for seed. The other thing it leads to is lack of genetic diversity. We found about five to 10% of farmers 
inadvertently planted the same variety from multiple brands. In other words, they bought brand X and they brought brand Y, uh, again, named different products, but they were the exact same types of seeds. So if they, they didn't realize that was going on, so they were actually not diversifying uh, their genetic uh, uh, seed selection. So what did we see when we, we looked at, for example, a particular bag of seed? You know, we saw wide divisions in how much people were paying across the country for the seed. You know, in this particular case, a, a DeKalb variety seed, uh, you know, the, the mean or the, the kind of mid ground of what people were paying somewhere between 290 and $335 a bag with the average around 315. But you had 25% of the people, 25% of the farmers that were paying well over $335 a bag. So again, these are the same bags of seed uh, and should in principle be charged the same amount of money. We also looked at, well, maybe there's some, you know, yield effect in some sense that, that certain varieties of seed will give you better yield versus other varieties of seed. Again, because we know what those, those um, varieties were yielding, we were able to put together this nice map that showed actually that's not the case, that when the seed uh, productivity, in other words, the yield per bushel was accounted for, we actually did find quite a bit of difference in how much the farmer was paying. So red areas are areas where you're paying more per dollar a bushel uh, of, of production. And so, you know, red areas, you're, you're overpaying for seed and green areas were underpaying compared to kind of the norm. So again, it's an industry that was very um, opaque. It's very kind of, um, you know, hidden in terms of the actual product and it makes transparency difficult. Now, because we were able to do this in a network, farmers contributing seed labels, contributing invoices, we turn that back to them to help improve decision making. And you know, here's just one quote from a farmer in our network who said that seed relabeling opened my eyes. You know, you can buy the same hybrid from so many different companies, and the price difference was huge. It was a hundred dollars a bag. And so, just doing this study was pretty monumental uh, to many of the farmers in our network because they didn't know it existed. And once they were aware it existed, then they began be able to really become strategic shoppers around what they were actually buying and it, and it helped their bottom line. So the third thing I wanna talk about is consumer trends and how does a network influence consumer, or how does a network serve consumer trends? So uh, one example of this, and this is a topic that gets uh, bound, bounced around a lot in the last three or four years is sustainability. You know, sustainability, what does it mean? Well, I'm gonna give it this definition that it's really the ability for society uh, to uh, meet its needs for food without com compromising tomorrow's resources. And so there are companies, you know, major uh, consumer packaged good companies like Unilever, like Dannon, uh, like Nestle, that are starting to really think hard about what does sustainability mean? Because consumers are talking about sustainability. And how do we service that? How do we meet that need? And the dilemma this poses is that sustainability and sustainability practices, once you define a practice that is sustainable, it's not an attribute or a characteristic of the final commodity that you produce. I mean, think about corn. You know, you can't go in and grade it in the elevator or was it grown uh, with a cover crop? Was it grown in a you know, low till situation? These are things you can't grade or, or, or fix attributes to. And that, so therefore it's really hard to price. So what we've been working on at FBM is trying to figure out, okay, how can we meet the needs of the consumers who want to know or are willing to pay for practices that enhance soil, that enhance water use, and that enhance air quality? And how does that, that system get back and towards price signals that benefit the farmers? And, and again, it's, it's hard in a, in a kind of commodity specific system. You can think about, you know, we can certainly, we have systems in place for identifying organic grains or organic products. You know, there's standards, there's, there's ways to measure it. So organics well-defined, uh, conventional or, or non-GMO, you know, those are ways that we can also do that. But when we start talking about sustainability, it's kind of a menu of um, crop production practices. Is it, you know, it's, it's tillage, it's cover management, it's all these different things. And so 
it becomes very hard to sort of create a market system to do that. So a network where farmers are participating and they're choosing from these particular uh, practices and those practices then get associated with the crop that gets sold to a company. And so, you know, you might be a farmer, you're, you're going to do some cover crops, you're going to do uh, some tillage practices, and those practices are, are going to be bundled in with the sale of the grain or the commodity that you sell to some in company. And so this is, again, the value of a network where data is being shared. So we're, we're you know, having a system of farmers, uh, the farmers are doing practices and that data associated with that practices is in turn bundled with the product uh, upstream. And then obviously the, the benefit is that hopefully those price signals will then in turn feed back to the farmer. So that is ultimately the goal of how consumer trends can sort of um, be met or met more effectively with a network and data solution. So Again, consumer preferences are not easily transmitted through market signals. So the network, we can identify candidate farmers who are really good for this. And we can use data um, to benchmark performance and certainly you know, monitor um, you know, the, the adoption of certain practices. So that's kind of my talk. I just want to highlight you know, what are kind of the key benefits of big data and analytics you know, in a network situation where you have farmers sharing data you know, it's basically a way for you to learn uh, from the collective wisdom of everyone in the network. So, you know, we're, we're forming data that is beneficial to farmers. We're providing prescriptive, focused analytics that help you make better decisions. And finally, you know, even at a market level standpoint, you know, by farmers collectively sharing information about their own marketing transactions, they're able to gain insights and better information about markets that are can be opaque and can be difficult uh, to navigate in. So thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me by email. And thank you for joining.